I'm Eric Jacobson from Twin Cities Dermatopathology, and I have the honor today to be with uh, Dr. Wilma Bergfeld from the Cleveland Clinic, somebody who really needs no introduction, but uh, a past president of our society, uh, a Founders Award recipient, and uh, thank you so much for joining me today. You're very welcome. Um, so just as, a, as background, how did you find your way into dermatopathology? Well, I grew up at the Cleveland Clinic, basically. I was an intern there and then went into dermatology residency there. And John Hazrick, who was a dermatopathologist and a dermatologist trained at the University of Minnesota, was the chair. And so we were heavy into dermatopathology. So he sort of instilled a desire for me to go through a dermatopathology program. And it so happened that my husband was drafted in the Berry Plan and at that time he was stationed at the Naval Academy over in Annapolis, Maryland. And I said, wow, I could go to the AFIP, which was the only program then in dermatopathology under Elson Helwig. And I made application and I was selected. So I commuted from Annapolis, Maryland to Washington, D.C. every day for almost a year and a half doing this fellowship. And that was a very unique opportunity, actually, because I sat with dermatopathologist training from derm-based and path-based under Elson Helwig, and they rotated the service fellows in every three months. So I met this whole host of people that were so bright and so able from all over the country that I was very excited about that training period. And Elson Helwig is an icon in my eyes. He was uh, the first, the big first in the United States, basically following Lerner and a few other people that had started to develop demand pathology in this country. But, you know, going back in history, it came out of Europe. Mm -hmm. well, that's fantastic. So how did you land then ultimately at the Cleveland Clinic? I was an intern there, mm -hmm. and I, my husband and I were married in medical school. Yeah. And I was pregnant in medical school, and I, had, I was interviewing for dermatology and internship, pregnant, which was very unusual at that time because at that time, there were only five women in the medical school class of 120. So it was unusual to be a woman, then go to interview pregnant. I mean, that was almost a no-no. I was accepted, and my husband was accepted at Henry Ford and, and Cleveland Clinic. I was from Cleveland. I had parents in Cleveland. I thought, well, i got to go to Cleveland. And so I went, we went to the Cleveland Clinic. My husband evolved to being one of the first sports medicine orthopedic surgeons in the United States. And, he and a, about 14 fellows developed that specialty. So we've had a very illustrious career at the Cleveland Clinic, the two of us. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and to see the Cleveland Clinic <coughs> now, you think, well, it was sort of inevitable. But it sounds like it wasn't always no. so inevitable at all. No. You sort of created some of this, I, all, all of this. I was the first dermatopathologist at yeah. the Cleveland Clinic, yes. And I was able to do that because I was able to bridge dermatology and pathology, and that was because I had been an intern there, and I had rotated into pathology, and they wanted me to be a pathologist. But I like to see patients as well, and I felt that was a little bit confining for my personality. So I had developed this nice rapport with the head of pathology. So when I came back as a dermatopathologist, they said that I could serve as a dermatopathologist for two departments, dermatology and pathology. At that time, we were reading out two reports on one case, one from Durham and one from PATH. So I was able, able to make that bridge and had been in that position since 1975 as head of dermatopathology. Wow. And um, I think one of, the, one of the things that I find so amazing about your department, um, your former fellow and my fellowship director, Dirk Elson, talks about the family of dermatopathology. You've created a family, but of both dermatologists and pathologists who are both extremely accomplished. How, how were you able to do that? Well, it was really my husband. Uh, he's an old football player and believes in sort of team sports. Mm -hmm. And I, I was a cheerleader, so that, you know, a team a little bit, but not as big as football. But when he started his orthopedic sports medicine training program, he decided he had to keep his fellows close, that they would be a united group. And he kept saying to me, Wilma, why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing this? So I finally decided, after a few years, not right away, obviously, that we would be a group and that I wanted my fellows to know each other, to help promote each other, to help each other. And so this began like in 1978, 79. And so what has happened is that we unite, we meet at the American Society of Durham Path 
uh, meeting every year. We sit at a banquet table together. I announce that we're going to sit together, and I introduce the new fellows to the old fellows. And what has evolved over all of these years, they help each other. And I'm very happy to say we've had four presidents yeah. coming from my group. If you look at what's out there today in the poster area and also on the platform presentations, we are extremely well represented. Because it's been always my idea and my thought that not only do you bound them together, but you force them to present. Mm -hmm. And that this is an expectation of our training program that you do some projects and that we show our stuff that we can do a fairly good job. We have a quality group. Yeah. And so this has happened. And it's, again, an evolution of just keeping everybody together. Yeah. So of all the things that you've done building this uh, incredible department and your awards and everything, are there some things uh, about which you're particularly proud? Well, I am particularly proud to being the mentor of all these young people who have been so successful. I mean, I cannot make them successful. I can just take them and encourage them and show them pathways and, and develop their goals a little bit better than they've been able to do themselves. So I am really proud of them because they've been high performers. It seems like you've also given that on a fair amount to, to your fellows. So those, those fellows then beget other fellows that uh, I think take some of that same attitude forward. Um, so as somebody who's seen dermatopathology through a lot of changes, what do you see as the future of dermatopathology? Well, we held a director's meeting yesterday, the dermatopathology's directors, and we had some presentations there that were so almost scary. We're obviously moving towards all digital mm -hmm. and ePath. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to have to incorporate that into our training programs. We've already done that at the clinic where we have a virtual teaching session at least once a month. We also have ePath. So we're already into that digital age, but it's going to be even bigger, really bigger. I'm not sure in the future we'll even have glass or microscopes that they will all be scanned and we'll be looking at wonderful scans, high power, low power, whatever. <laughs> And I was talking to one of my fellows, Laszlo Carey, who is a digital king, and he's telling me, now you can get these pieces that go on your, your face, like a goggle that produces everything wow. and puts all virtual this Virtual reality. Virtual reality is going to be during path. So I think that our pathology is going to change dramatically, dramatically. Yeah. And then there's this problem, I suspect it's a problem for the young people, is that they're going to standardize things. We're going to have some software packages that we almost don't need a pathologist for, because by this time, we will have standardized what is needed for the diagnosis and somehow created these software packages that the software will be able to make the diagnoses. Well, I think that that's something else. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to be more accurate. There'll be no variability, depending on the individual and, what, and the stains and the mm -hmm. markers that we have today. But I think the future is going to be somewhat exciting for all the young people because they're all very digital, very computer-wise, et cetera. But for we old people, <laughs> I have to have help. <laughs> I have to have some help. Uh, but uh, anyhow, I think that's the future. I think that uh, we also heard that there is a diminishing number of pathologists, just general pathologists, yeah. being trained. When we asked the dermatopathology training directors, how many spots do you have? Those people who had three spots or two spots have all gone down to one spot because of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not our case at the Cleveland Clinic because we do need three people at least and hopefully four someday because of our service and teaching obligations and also the fact that we need them to do research. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just part of our program, research. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're looking forward to developing a new curriculum and the training directors are really engaged into getting a curriculum that's modern, up-to-date, incorporating some of these new techniques as well. So I'm also very proud of heading up that group because uh, we put some organization into the directors and had them cooperate so they're not individuals, individuals creating their own programs. We're trying to unite and have some kind of standardization of everyone's training program. This group introduced the in-service exam which I, and it was then voted on by the society, the ASDP society, that they would oversee it. And that's a big one, because that's having them move out of their comfort zone to now 
organize an educational program and oversight for a fellowship, not a residency, but a fellowship. So, and we're asking them to even do more than that. That's fantastic. So as you have fellows graduate and move out into the marketplace and actually move out into practice, um, what advice do you give them? Well, the biggest advice is that <laughs> you know your stuff. Mm -hmm. You are well yeah. trained. And I've had you speak enough at all kinds of meetings and present yourself so you can speak at a meeting also. And you can write a paper. That's one thing. So feel confident going out. The second thing I tell them, which I think is most ex important, is know your client. Visit your client. Be a friend of your client. Because you'll find, and especially with melanomas, that there are regional differences of how melanomas or atypical melanocytic hyperplasias are read out. And their comfort level will be with how it's done in that area. So be sure that you know that. Because if you lose the trust of your client, which is usually a dermatologist, if you lose the trust, you have lost it. So you must create some kind of communication between the two of you so there is a trust. Even if you've made a mistake, you're communicating. You've made a mistake, and I'm going to go forward. Tell me more about the clinical. We're going to put some more whatever markers on this. We'll see what we can do with this. Because everyone can understand a mistake, but they can't understand if they haven't heard about it, haven't communicated with you. So if I were to say the two things, training is you're very capable. You're going to be able to do a good job to communicate with your clients. And do you think that um, these days most people who graduate uh, from your program are doing all derm path? Or do you find that they're doing a mixture of things? Well, I can say that those that are derm based yeah. are probably doing more derm path than those that are path based. Interesting. However, uh, many of them want to have their foot in the derm clinical world a little bit. But the pathologist that we have trained just more recently, it was 50-50. Mm -hmm. One went into a derm program as a dermat pathologist. The other went into private practice pathology lab, who's doing a little bit of everything in derm path. So right now, I, I believe that the pathologists are, are a little bit more uncomfortable with not being able to do as much derm path as they wished. But I have said to them, if you like whom you're going to be working with, you can grow your derm path. And when I said get to know your client, I really want to say be involved in the dermatology community. Mm -hmm. Because if you go to the meetings, you get to know them. Again, it's not on a one-to-one, -one, but it's a little broader base. You will be successful. I think you're right. I think one of the things that pathologists struggle with is they start off as pathologists. And they sort of, uh, you have to enter a different world. And I think that that's actually... Uh, something that, that is harder for pathologists. I think you're absolutely right. Well, I think that uh, you chose dermatopathology because there was something exciting about yeah. it. I, and I could ask you why you chose it. But what I see in the pathology-based trainee is the fact that they love the interaction with the cl clinicians, you know, looking at the clinical and the quickness of how you can resolve a problem in the fact that you can come up with a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I think they like that. They're a little hesitant, though, when they have to see a patient. Somehow they're intimidated by that, um, some more than others. But in the program, training programs, they have to see patients, so I, we force them out. That's good. That's <laughs> you've you got to yeah. go out and see these people. You've got to yeah. talk to these clinicians because uh, if you don't, you have no idea the tension they are under many times to make a diagnosis, especially in some of these uh, unique problems. We are just listening to the infectious disease presentation. So many immunosuppressed people, so many people on drugs that are immunosuppressing, so many older people who are immunosuppressed, we're going to see infection and you've got to know what those look like clinically. Mm -hmm. And so what we see is mo mostly the derm-based derm pathologists presenting on those infections because yeah. they're seeing them and they're being bewildered by them and the angio uh, invasive fungi are life-threatening. They right. have to be treated right away. So we see that the derm-based ones are, are more proactive, like call up the physician, you yeah. better treat this. I haven't got it absolutely isolated, but we got a phycomycosis here, we got an angio-invasive one. This one has to be treated immediately. So I, I think that in some instances that sort of shows me that the pathology-based person needs to be in the clinic a little bit more, need to be talking to the clinician, and most of them enjoy it once they get involved. Yeah, I think you're right. 
One last question. Um, just as a, so as a, you're a past president of our society. What do you see as our society's role moving forward? Well, I am really delighted to see the role right now <laughs> because when I was president, uh, now about nine years ago, we had trouble moving this group of pathologists, dermatopathologists, into the arena of politics. Uh, about a third belonged to the AMA. Now, I realize that the AMA has, you know, there are various opinions about the AMA, but the AMA is the only voice that physicians have. And my husband, the orthopedic surgeon, won't belong to the AMA, so I, I, we're a divided family there. But I say it's the only voice. They are not going to just listen to the dermatologist or the pathologist. They want a united voice. So you've got to be at the table. And so what has happened over the last few years, especially with my fellows becoming presidents who agree with me, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was Tom Helm and Dirk Elson. Zolt was a little bit earlier. But uh, anyhow, we have an AMA representative. We have more AMA members. We have a voice at the table. We have a voice at the table of RUC where your, actually your salary is determined. Mm -hmm. And so I see us moving into that arena. Yesterday at the board meeting, I heard for the first time that we're actually going to have a position paper. Whoa! I mean, we need position papers on various things that we as a group, both derm-based and path-based dermatopathologists can agree upon so that we can have a face on certain issues. Now what those will be, I don't know, but they are going to move forward. This next thing is they're interested in communication now. They want to show that the dermatopathologists internally as well as externally are of value. And so we're going to form a communications committee. I think it's a very exciting time because we're now not just this isolated little body functioning because we like what we do and that we're so sweet to each other. Now we're going to have going to be a force. And I think that's important. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for, for joining me and for agreeing to do this interview <laughs> and everything. My pleasure.